No, actually, I was born July 18th, 1952. Wow, I am old. And what was great about that is all the different decades of music that I got to go through. The 50s, tail end of the 50s. The 60s, which was my time. The 70s, which I thought was junk at the time. Now I love it. Four on the floor, Casey and the Sunshine Band. I came to love music just by being around the environment where music was being played. My family, there was a bunch of musicians in the group. My dad played, my uncle Mike played organ, my uncle Steve played drums and sax. So there was always, whatever house we went to for, you know, Sundays or whatever, there was always somebody playing music. So I kind of got ingrained into the culture of having music around me at a young age. And in 1977, and my dad came to hear us play at Klein Hands Music Hall, and um, he lasted about a song, and then he went downstairs, lit up the Lucky Strike, and had a beer, or five. And um, so an early, early recollection of my home life was my dad was alcoholic, so it was, it was kind of difficult on some of us kids. Some of the kids, it, it didn't affect them much. Me, he liked to abuse with, uh, with the strap and the kicking and the belittling and all that stuff. So at an early memory is him whipping me with a belt. So, you know, not, if you look up good times, <laughs> My picture wasn't in that, that part of the book. So, but I, I dealt with it, but it be, you know, I'm sure it affects any child that grows up in that kind of environment. And it affects how you think and it messes with your values and is this the way it is? And is, it, is this the way I should be if I ever have kids? And you know, and you sort it out in your mind and no, it's not the way you should be if you have kids. You, you don't touch your kids. So that's how people live today. But back in the 50s, I mean, it was, was blue-collar people trying to scrape by with kids. And it was, you know, it was probably horrible working in a steel plant. My mother worked in a factory where they made um, uh, Wonder Bread. So she'd come home with the ho-hos and the ding-dongs and the Twinkies. So I imagine the Twinkies probably affected the kids where we wanted to slap somebody too. Because they say Twinkies are, you know, dangerous to eat. Anyway. Um, but, you know, you get through that stuff. But that's why I w was getting antsy about being in school. And I just wanted to get out and, and go play music is really what what I wanted to do. So at 17 years old, I moved out of the house and just made my way around Buffalo, little apartments and staying with friends and, you know, kind of went out on the road in my own hometown. But uh, as I said, it strengthens your values, how you're brought up. And even if your parents are crazy or not crazy, they should instill a value system into you that you can carry through your entire life. And even though it was chaotic, my mother kind of stabilized things a little bit, and, and we were taught the values that I live by today. Integrity, honesty, and things like that. Well, my, first, my early music career was spent watching my brother, my older brother, who was a big influence on me with his band. They would set up in our basement, work out uh, their tunes, and, um, and I was just like starting to get the bug. You know, I'd watch the drummer and go, that's cool, I want to do that. And slowly but surely, when they weren't rehearsing, all the gear was at my mom's house, so I'd jump on the drums and try to play. But 
My first real drum set was a metal chair with, and the cushion was the snare drum and the back of the chair was the cymbal. <laughs> so I'd put on records, listen to them, and play along, banging on the chair, banging on the snare. And uh, that was my drum set. But I started to get the feel of what it felt like to, to play drums. So when I sat down behind this guy's drums, which were too big for me, I kind of like was able to execute some beats. Not beats like we have today, but beats. You know what I'm saying? And um, slowly but surely, I started practicing with them on the off nights when the drummer couldn't be there. And then they just kicked the drummer out and got me. So, but my proudest gig, I think, where I felt the most love was this uh, event that the guys from Guitar Center uh, put together for me, mainly Bob Belcher and Glenn Noyes and Smitty, put together an event called Richie Palooza. And um, I was in charge of the music and not, not able to be in charge of anything else. You know, we're all, all the people that work at Guitar Center want to be in charge of something. And I was in charge of the music, which was awesome for me. But what started happening is all these people started reaching out to me because I have stage four liver cancer and been given a, you know, couple time frames now. And these people, these, the drum community and the Guitar Center family reached out to do this event for me and I had to treat the whole thing like it was third person because it was overwhelming to accept all the love, <laughs> as Ringo would say, peace and love, uh, coming my way. It was, it was almost unbelievable is this really happening as i sat on stage playing with the three bands that i put together for the event i'd look over on my right and there's greg bissonette a world-renowned drummer plays with ringo and on my left i look over and there's danny seraphine the drummer from chicago and prior to the palooza event i was getting emails from Mark Schulman from Pink and Doan Perry from Jethro Tull and Zildjian came out and said, hey, we want, you know, we want to give you some symbols. Hey, we want to give you this, we want to give you that. And I'm thinking, I better croak <laughs> or I'm not going to be worthy of all these gifts. But anyway, so I've done a lot of gigs. I've been playing since I was 10. I'm 62. I've done a lot of gigs, and, uh, but the Palooza event was the one that touched me the most, and I still think about it every day, and I really think about it when um, just after Thanksgiving, I was driving through Malibu Canyon, and I was with my two cousins showing them around, and the phone rang, and it said, uh, no caller ID, unknown number. Well, who picks up those calls? No one. But I answered it. And the voice on the other end said, Richie, it's the other Richard. And I went, Ringo? Hey, mate, how you feeling? And I was, imagine a freaking beetle calls your cell phone. And um, he was awesome. I mean, he's been a big hero of mine because, like I said, February 9th, 1964, sitting in front, front of the TV, and here comes the Beatles, and you go, that's what I'm going to do. So he reached out uh, to call and said, uh, you know, I'm sorry I didn't make it to the event. We had a thing that we were doing for George in New York, and we couldn't make it. 
how you feeling, mate? And we chit-chatted back and forth, and I cut up with him, too, and I go, uh, I hear you're on a macrobiotic diet. And he goes, oh, yeah, Barbara keeps me going on that. That's his wife. He go, I go, so you don't eat anything with a heartbeat, right? And he said, uh, well, on turkey day, Barbara cuts me off a big slice of white meat, and I eat that, and I go, does it make you sick? He goes, no, I fucking love it. So we're chit-chatting back and forth about where he lives, and I didn't do the star thing, you know, and, so, you know, 20 minutes later, we're still chatting, and, uh, you know, we're laughing about different things, and, you know, I took, at the end, I, I did say, you know, obviously you've influenced many, many generations of drummers, and uh, it's awesome that you called me, and I'll, you know, call me some other time, too. <laughs> if you're not doing anything, and one, one of the funny things he said was, uh, he lives in California now, and he's got a, I said, what's going on with the new album? Greg Bissonette told me you have a new album. He said, yeah, we're recording it out in the guest house. The beauty of that is I don't have to have any guests when we're recording, so nobody's staying with me for a change. And uh, we ended the call with, uh, you know, a lot of thank yous and, you know, take care of your health and, Wow. Freaking awesome. A beetle called me. I mean, really, think about that. So, what event touched me the most? That one. And it still does, because it's still, it's still happening. There's uh, a lot of uh, overflow, what fills me up inside. And that has been almost 32 years at Guitar Center, and the people that I've been able to help, that's been, I feel like I've accomplished something that I was able to uh, get inside people's heads, find out what makes them tick, point them in the right direction, and they became the executives and, and backbone of a good, of Guitar Center. And so I think that's a, a great accomplishment. I'm not tooting my horn saying I was the only one, but I've spent more time with our people than anybody I know in the company because it was, I always looked at them as they were my best customers. I had my regular customers in the retail stores, but my best customers were the people that I was mentoring and helping them through their life experiences, and, and it filled me up. You know, to be able to give that way to people is awesome. And, and to see them excel, as I told uh, Aaron, our producer, that we used to look for people that had their lights on. And uh, when I met her, you know in about five to 10 seconds, after meeting so many people over so many years and hiring and training and so on and so forth, you know if they have their lights on. And uh, when they do, I get going with them and I wanna be part of their uh, education, if you will to get to where they want to get to. That's my proudest accomplishment. People. Hello, Lily. Hello, Lily. Did you come from a musical family and musical upbringing? Yes, I did. I thought I'd just address that, but... Yeah, okay. The I... Wait. The I quit school routine? Do we want to talk about that? <laughs> and there was all this sushi laid out, and there was like three or four sushi chefs. Oh, yeah. And I went, what 
comes back. They go, oh, raw fish, you eat love. <laughs> I go, I ain't eating that shit. <laughs> and burgers. Yeah, right. So I was like freaked out. By, of course, by the time we left, I was like every day. Hooked, yeah. yeah. So when we got back, mm -hmm. the night we got back from Tokyo, we were totally screwed up on the time chain. Directly to Little Tokyo for sushi. Of course. That's so funny. And I've been eating it since. You know, you don't know what you're doing. I loved to drink when I drank, but I was a fun drunk. I wasn't abusive. You know, I just wanted to have fun and laugh and no different now. Just want to have fun and laugh. That's my proudest accomplishment, people. Oh, this looks so cool. With the drums and stuff?